Welcome back to the Osteoclast channel and this is the materials used in plastering in the basic series. Don't forget to watch the rest of this playlist in the link provided below. What I'm going to go through today is some of the padding that we use and the casting materials so you can become more familiar with what the options are that you might come across in your institution. So let's jump into it. The first thing we do when we put a plaster on is put the under padding on. In most ED departments, as well as theatres, we'll typically go straight to what's called a padding lap webral. This is a terrible soft layer that we can use to wrap around the limb. We do this circumferentially and we go beyond the layers of the plaster so that we can fold it back over at the end. Webral is the most common type that we see and it's used because it has a good conforming nature to it and it tears easily. The other options are soft band, which is a synthetic version which is slightly thicker and perhaps holds reductions less well in my opinion, and vel band, which is another one that doesn't really tear so well. In plaster technicians' hands, you might also see what's called under padding or stocking net. This is a cylinder of material that can be used to protect a whole limb in one easy placement. I typically don't see this used so much in emergency departments or theatres, but it is used in fracture clinics, for example. One of the other options we have, we talk about this in our plaster instruction session, is the Delta Dry, which is a version of a stocking that is actually waterproof. And typically we use two layers of it, and patients can actually get that wet, so long as they use a waterproof outer plaster type material, which we talk about later on, which is synthetic. When we come to the actual plastering and casting, we have two typical materials that we use, being plaster of Paris and synthetic. Plaster of Paris is known as plaster of Paris because of the gypsum mines that existed underneath Paris that originally, I guess, were mined to make the material, but a lot of it now comes from Mexico. It's the white plaster material that you often see in casts that kids can draw on and is used for back slabs as well. The alternative is what we call synthetic. Now, a lot of people call this a fiberglass cast, but it's very rare to actually use true fiberglass because of the shards that are formed when you use a plaster saw to remove it. So most of the time we use polyester, which is what I've got here today. The synthetic material is one that you can choose your colors. It's not as easy to draw on, but you can. And it has a bit of a spring to it. So typically when you're molding, you need to hold it for longer and it's not preferred for the reduction of fractures where you need to have a careful mold and close conformity with the skin. The big difference when using the synthetic cast material is that you must have gloves on. Whilst you can wash away most of the plaster, except for maybe around your fingernails, this stuff sticks like super glue and you have to wait for days for it to come off. So definitely wear gloves and have a special set of scissors used to cut it because you can't tear it with your hands. When it comes to back slab materials, most people will still use plaster of Paris and just unravel the roll to make a wad of plaster in a rectangle. One of the alternatives that is synthetic is you can use one of these materials such as a polyester, which is the same as the synthetic material here that comes in the rolls, but this one comes as a wad in a protective um, coat of cotton, and it can be used then to just be cut to shape, sprayed with water or dunked, placed inside this felt, and then placed on the limb with some crepe. So it's a little bit quicker, and it's easier to remove and put back on without it being damaged so readily. When it comes to contrasting the difference between plaster of Paris and synthetic materials, Plaster of Paris has that main advantage, as I said before, that it's better for reductions. Otherwise, it's, it's heavier, takes longer to dry, um, and is probably more prone to cracking, although both can break if you abuse them. Synthetic, on the other hand, it's lightweight, it is waterproof, and so if it is combined with a waterproof under padding, so not web rule, you can actually get it wet and let it dry. And we talk about some of those instructions again in that post-cast instructions video. The downside, I think, of the synthetic is that it's a little bit harder to work with. A lot of people aren't comfortable working with it. And especially when you're going around things like the thumb for a wrist splint, you do need to have some scissors to carefully mold and fold it around the joints. When you cut it, and especially at the ends, you can have stick sharp parts, and you might need to use a file or something that the patient can help roughen off or smooth off any areas that are sharp and causing protrusions, which is probably less commonly encountered with plaster. Plaster of Paris is maybe a little bit more messy in terms of getting white stuff all over the floors. Uh, but it is probably more commonly used in most departments. It's also good to be familiar with some of the equipment that can be used in putting on and taking off casts. Normal scissors or shears are good for cutting through plaster as you try to contour, for example, a full cast around the thumb, or for taking casts off. But most people prefer to use this for cast removal, which is plaster scissors, because it's thinner and gets under the plaster padding in an easier way. These little crimpers are handy if you have them, if you have a part of the cast that's rubbing off the skin, you can slide it under the cast, crimp it, and bend it away. 
These are two different versions of the same thing, which are plaster splitters. Basically, they fit inside a cut in the cast that you make with your plaster saw and can be squeezed to open the cast up. It's important that you've gone through all the way down to the padding before you do this so that the cast actually splits. These little chompers can be used to slide under plaster and cut it as you work along. It's an alternative to a plaster saw, but most people do the plaster splitting with the plaster saw. And finally, a file could be handy, particularly for fiberglass casts, just to trim off any sharp edges that might be contacting the patient's skin, especially if you've used these scissors to cut the fiberglass to circumnavigate some of the digits. Obviously, we have the plaster saw, which is the workhorse of our plaster removal. A lot of them that you use in emergency won't have a vacuum attached to them and will just have the disc. And one of the key things that I explain to patients is it's not a circular saw, which is what everyone freaks out about. It just vibrates very quickly backwards and forwards. And I actually find it reassuring for patients if I turn it on and gently just touch it on the pad of my thumb to show them that it's not going to cut your skin. Obviously, if you push hard enough and you get through all the padding, it can cut the skin. But most of the time, the little um, saw parts of the blade get caught up in the padding and aren't very good at getting through that. It can get very hot. And of course, watch the removal videos that are linked below for more information about how to take plasters off. I hope that comes off on the casting materials for everyone and gives you a bit of an introduction to what the options are that are out there. I reiterate for most people that are starting out, it will just be some simple under padding and plaster of Paris for most complete casts and back slabs when you're beginning your, on your plastering journey. But you might encounter some of the other things more commonly in the plaster rooms in a fracture clinic. Don't forget to keep watching for the rest of the videos about how to apply these casts. Mm -hmm.